Hey. Hey. What's up, Lynn? What's up, Amelia? How is your Memorial Day weekend? Uh, a little different than the norm, but it's pretty nice. I'm chilling down here in, in what is raining at the moment, but sunny Florida uh, in the Sunshine State. I plan to get some sunlight as soon as this thunderstorm rolls by us, but uh, it's good. Everything is good. How is your weekend going? My weekend is wonderful. Um, I'm in Massachusetts, so uh, visiting the family for the Memorial Day weekend. Um, my little godchild, uh, Nishé, had her princess birthday party. She's five years old. So Ooh. it was just so adorable. I know. And shout out to Nairi. You know, he's holding it down. Um, that's my other godchild from the same mom. And um, yeah, we're going to send out prayers for him to get well because he's not feeling so well. So, uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to send out prayers and cheers. And Trooper Man, you know, my, my little warrior, you got this, all right? So just keep on doing what you got to do, and uh, we're going to be home soon before we know. Cool. Exactly. Cool. So we got a really special show. We have a very special show. Um, I'm kind of happy about this show. Very interesting. Kind of a surprise, but not really a surprise. Uh, we've got an amazing, an amazing woman who is the uh, epitome of women's empowerment and leadership and public service. She went from some super humble beginnings here in Florida, went to New York, turned up there, <laughs> became an educator, uh, got multiple degrees, came back to Florida, and then just took over. Like Big Fish, Small Pond took over the whole story there now. She's I know. I am so excited. But before we get to that, what are you sipping on today? I'm sipping on some piña colada. 
I Except instead that. of run, I got vodka, coconut vodka. So it's really good. Well, see, I would drink that. But anyway, I'm drinking today. I am drinking uh, vodka and cranberry. I'm keeping it really simple. And I'm not reaching for my glass yet, but I'll be reaching for it during the show. So y'all will see me sipping on something sexy. Y'all know what we do on Sundays here. So yeah, um, yeah, pretty good. We can get it started however we want to get it started. Memorial Day weekend is the unofficial start to summer. No matter where you are, everybody's looking for a barbecue. Everybody's looking for something. You can wear white right now. You can, can wear white ball. pants, white hats, white yeah. everything. A white lot of people say that that's not the rule anymore. White what is you always think? in style down here. I just want you to know. Uh, I, I was at all last week. Everybody had on white. I was like, see, this is what I'm talking about. If it's 80 degrees and above every day, white is always in style. There's never a time you can't wear white. I've worn winter white down here when it was That's 80 degrees. Yeah, I've worn winter white down here. And it just works. And nobody messes with you. And we don't look at anybody like they're crazy. So, but yes, everybody <laughs> up north. Everybody up north and everywhere else in the country, y'all get it popping. Oops, y'all get it popping, and y'all can wear your white now because Memorial Day is when you can officially wear your white. So there you go. So Lynn, before we bring in this guest, I really wanna yeah. before we bring in this extra special guest, which I'm so excited to be interviewing and talking with, I wanted to just talk briefly about Memorial Day weekend. I found out historically that Memorial Day actually was in April and it actually was commemorated and initiated by African Americans because there was a cemetery that was a mass cemetery that they didn't get the recognition for during the war and so the people decided to um, do a parade and dig up the bodies and just make a grave site out of the location and you know what's so wild is when I was uh, doing the story like when I was investigating about it they said that the children walked first with flowers and then the parents followed behind and the scent of the flowers kind of filled everybody right and as a young girl every Memorial Day weekend here in Massachusetts the young kids that that received communion would walk the parade first and then we would go to the graveside of the community to honor those that were deceased. And I never understood why I love this holiday so much, but now I understand it was a spiritual thing over anything. Yeah, so I sent you guys that article that was out of Time Magazine that spoke about that, right? So it was mass grave for not only for slaves, but for people of color that fought in the Civil War that weren't getting the recognition, right, back in 1865. So it became a mass grave. And it's interesting, yes, what you said is absolutely true. The young people went first with the flowers, and they said it was so many flowers that it became inundated with the scent of the flowers. That's what became the memorial, was the scent of the flowers. It just looked like an entire, what's the word I want to say, uh, nursery full of flowers when, when they put down all the flowers for all the people that had died and uh, previous slaves and people that fought in the Civil War and did not get recognition, people of color. And I think it was either the last week of April, the first day of May. So it wasn't really the last weekend in May. That happened as it became turned into something more for our servicemen here. And, and let me just say this first and foremost, I have nothing but love and respect for our military any military, you know what I mean? Because the bottom line is all gave some, but some gave all. And this is for those that gave all, that they're willing to lose their lives for this country and for the rights and for the freedom. There was nothing more honorable than that. And I could also tell you this, our special guest is huge on repping the veterans, yes. that whole thing. And I'm, I'm like that too. Like I feel like there's no greater honor than to be in service of this country. These people fight for our freedoms and our rights when other people won't, you know what I mean? And then they go to other countries and try to help them get their stuff together. So Memorial Day is a huge, 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 uh, big, big deal. And I'm just glad that more of our stories of our people of color are coming out and, and what we did to help participate in, in this country and the things that we've done that are sometimes overlooked and not talked about. And it's not that we want to be 
you know, so applauded for what we've done. We just want to be recognized. Just, just, just exactly. realize that we played a part in this American culture. This American history is our history as well. So we're not trying to step on anybody else's work or what they've accomplished, but just recognize you guys didn't do it by yourself. So exactly, and you know, the term of foundational black, I'm really loving because they were and are the foundation of so many traditions, so many inventions, so many things that are were twisted over time. And shout out to Deerfield too, because you guys just did something with another cemetery with 300 yeah, so, uh, people in recognition of that as well. So yeah, I can't even speak to it as well as our guest, but I was there for the event that she spearheaded and really went all the way in, there were, uh, if I'm correct, uh, black midwives, and these women needed to be recognized. And uh, our guests fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. And if you go to the park now and see the statues of, um, it's it's like a roots moment <laughs> when you or oh, or like lion king, like the circle of life. Like you really have to go there and feel the spirituality in this in this memorial park. Just amazing so yeah let's get to it shall we let's just yeah let's forward. get to it let's bring our special lady on board welcome 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 here we go Woo! so we want to bring on former state representative Gwen Clark Reed she has been a mover and a shaker from day one I mean from Florida to New York and New York she did amazing great things that we're going to talk about and then came back and took Florida by storm. So let's definitely, can we get another round of applause, D-Mecca, for this amazing yeah, woman? Yeah. This, this pioneer, this new oh, thank you. I call her mom. Mm. I don't know what y'all call her, I call her mom. So, you know, I, but I'm gonna- Oh, I call her the lady of ladies. <laughs> the woman, that's what I call her. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Sipping Something Sexy. Um, my first question is just, oh, oh gosh. <laughs> My first question, that's how nervous I am with you, um, is just basically, what are you sipping on today? Well, cranberry juice at the moment. <laughs> just some nice cranberry juice. <laughs> okay, good. I love it. I love it. That's refreshing. It's an antioxidant. It's very healthy for you, and I love that. I love that. So, um, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Miss um, Clark Reed, and why politics was so important to you? Well, first of all, let me say thank you for having me on uh, the show today. And uh, I heard you all talk about, let me just say something about the Memorial Day uh, conversation that you were having. And you wondered why um, the flowers were so important. Um, as a child, I remember it as Decoration Day, uh, not Memorial Day. So it was May 30th, um, and it was Decoration Day. And yes, it was the start of summer. And we looked forward to um, honoring our veterans, those who have fought and given the ultimate sacrifice of their life to help with the uh, country and help bring us to where we are today. We we have a lot a long way to go, as some of us might say. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be around to uh, celebrate with you all because um, my next step is looking for my maker and uh, asking him Not to now. bring me home safely. But, we ain't uh, here now. <laughs> <laughs> but I respect I that, am. but we ain't here. We need you as long as we can keep you. So I'm gonna be talking exactly. to God. <laughs> yes, everyone says that, and I think that uh, the Lord is keeping me here for a special reason. I just want to say that um, I am a native Floridian. I was born in Delray Beach, Florida, in the historic uh, Frog Alley section. If you read upon the history of Delray Beach. You'll see that's where my family, who are Bahamians, that's where uh, we settled. And then from there, my grandfather had gotten accepted into Brooklyn College. And that's why we left 
Florida to go to New York so that he could continue his education uh, at Brooklyn College. Unfortunately, he did not get an opportunity to graduate from Brooklyn College, but I did. And he was right there on my graduation celebrating um, better, I think, louder than I was uh, for my graduation from Brooklyn College, where I received my Bachelor of Science degree in Health Science. And uh, from there, growing up, I went to a girls' high school. I'm a girls' high school graduate. And that's when uh, the school was, of course, at Nostrand Avenue and Halsey Street there in Brooklyn. And from there, I got involved even in high school because I participated in student government and um, encourage all of our listeners who have youngsters to encourage them to get involved in student government because that's where I got my first um, start and worked in the campaign of then to be elected Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. So my roots go back very, very deep into politics and from a long time of being involved in getting things done for the community and particularly for our children and to be sure that they were receiving the education and the uh, needs that they had being met in um, the education arena. Uh, you yeah. know, I was also very involved in when we call social justice, because I was right. involved with getting young people in Brooklyn who had been incarcerated and were now coming back to the community. Uh, I operated what was called the Learning Pulse, and that was a school um, that got these young people back into the community, looking for jobs, getting them their GEDs, and making sure that they were getting back on the right track. So That's education, fantastic. yes, education has always been uh, in my blood, as one might say, and moving forward. For a number of years, I you served. Know, yes. No, I was saying you have a master's degree in education. And, you know, I, I loved looking at your story because, you know, most times when teachers come out, they just become teachers. But you went right on this board, like one year later, right on the, the city board uh, of education, education board uh, directors, right? I went on to the, the New York City School Board. I was an elected, which is very important to say, I was an elected member of the school board in New York City when they had the school board. And I Why was, did you feel uh, that was so necessary? 18. Why did you feel that that was so necessary? Because most teachers just stay teachers. They don't necessarily say, oh, I'm going to go on the school board. Well, how did that well, come because, about? <laughs> because I had a, a political view of everything, uh, I saw the need to have a member of the school board being the first black person elected to that school board uh, because it covered East Flatbush and Canarsie. And you, you know, Canarsie, if you know anything about New York, in um, Brooklyn, you know that Canarsie was the seat of power, more or less, for the political movements in uh, New York City in Brooklyn. Exactly. So right. um, I had been not only uh, looking at the school board, I had been on the community planning board, District 9, which covered the uh, area I was living in. And that board directly... Uh, you know, we worked with the council people on the city on the city council in New York, your council person, your borough president. We were very involved there and not seeing anyone of color on the District 18 school board. Uh, some friends of mine decided that I needed to run for that school board. And fortunately, I was elected a member of the school board. And so I served and learned uh, about the operations of school boards and exactly what their, uh, what their role is in, you know, in the, in the school system. Yes, so you know, I, I wanted to ask, 
I wanted to ask you how important, if you had to surmise your whole political career in like a sentence or so, what would you say that was? My entire political career, I would say, was unbelievable because I never expected to reach the heights that I rose to and to still be very involved uh, as I am today in the political arena and in the education, particularly in education. Um, as a, Rose mm -hmm. might have told you that I left uh, New York and came back to Florida. And coming back to Florida, I had thought that maybe I would just, you know, be around, maybe do some subbing uh, in the teaching, uh, you know, here. But when I got back here, my family in Delray had already had something on the in the works for me uh, as far as teaching. And I went to teach in a school in West Palm Beach that had not hired a black person in 16 years to be in a member of their school faculty. And uh, it was a very interesting year because I had decided that I would possibly start on my doctorate at Florida Atlantic University. And the principal, I'll tell you just how things are, the principal was in the same class that I was. So wow. uh, it was you know, very interesting. But that following year, I came back to Broward County where I live and I was hired to teach at a school right near my house, Park Ridge Elementary. And that's where um, I started to get involved in the political side of things here in Florida. Uh, there was you know, a lot going on uh, with the neighborhoods and uh, developing the neighborhoods when transition uh, and meaning that they were going from the white majority to black. And uh, we had needs. Needs were, were not being met. I formed a homeowners association with some other members of the community. And that's what really propelled me into the political arena here. I got elected to the city commission here in Deerfield Beach and I served for 12 years uh, on that city commission. And all through and that. My next question. No, I'm saying all through I'm, that. I didn't mean to cut you off. All through that. Um, all through the, the 12 years on the city commission, I also served as president of what is the Broward League of Cities. And that is an organization that had not had a black female in its leadership in the 45 year history at that time. And I was able to secure that position and was over the 31 cities in Broward County as the representative and spokesperson for Broward County. And it was after that that I went Amazing. through um, about with, I am a cancer survivor. And uh, through all Amen. of this, no one really knew what was going on with me, but I did, uh, I am a survivor and was able to, after that, be elected to the Florida House of Representatives where I served for eight but years. before we go to that, wait, let's okay. not go to that yet. Let's not go to that yet because that, that right there, all of what you said is such an amazing feat. But I wanted to ask you how important for melanated people is for us to stay paid to, for us to pay attention to politics. How important is that? And why, in your opinion, must we pay attention? Because a lot of people are like, ah, I don't vote, I don't do this, I don't do Why is it so important? Well, we can look at where we are today and what is happening today and why we see the need for things to change and things to be handled differently. Being a registered voter is one thing but absolutely going to the polls and voting is where your power is you know we hear a lot of people having voter registration drives yeah yeah let me register to vote and what have you but election day nobody goes out to the polls yes it's fine to say i'm a registered voter 
but to get out and actually participate is where you need to put your your efforts going to the polls voting voting by mail however vote that is the most important thing you know what i loved about you your story too is that you know in the primaries you blew them away and then also you ran unopposed why do you think that happened was it because of just who you are and the tenacity and the reputation that you had as far as being a doer and accomplishing goals for the community that no one else could really contend yeah i'm going to take that yes as, a, as, as possibly what it could be because believe me people would say to me oh didn't i just see you around the corner oh but uh, didn't i just see you over here yes very visible in the community very visible in the district that i i uh, represented i represented seven cities in that district 92 in the house state legislature and i made sure that I was in my cities, finding out what's needed in my cities and trying to make it happen for them. As well as the city commission in Deerfield, in my district, District 2 that I represented. I made sure that when I got tickets and tickets were available for events that folks had never experienced or but I felt that they needed to be at, I made sure that they were a part of. I didn't just sit back and say, oh, I'm the city commissioner and I'm going, no. I dragged everybody, cat, dog, whomever, that I needed to go to a meeting or that I needed to show up and show that we had representation uh, in this particular issue. I made sure that they were there. So um, I'm, that I'm, that's very important. That is a very, very important part of being an elected official. To sit on the dais and vote, yes. I agree. Actually involve your community and letting them understand why you're voting the way you're voting and how sometimes you have to bite the bullet and do something that they may not like, but letting them understand what's going to happen in the future, hopefully, by doing that. Well, Miss Gwendolyn Clark Reed, we're going to take a short break. You're watching uh, Sipping Something Sexy right here on Twitch.tv, soon to be on She's the Boss Radio. We're going to take a commercial break and we'll be right back. Okay. All right, just joining on with my host, Brooklyn Ford, we have none other than Miss Gwendolyn Clark Reed, former House Representative Florida, and it's an honor to have her on. We're waiting for her right now. So, um, Lynn, what do you think so far? I think y'all going to let me ask this woman some questions. That's what I think. She's talking. You ask the question. I'm a, prop. I'm a human prop here, people, or sipping something sexy today. I should just sit here and be sipping. <laughs> why am I here? No, I'm waiting for you. That's why I did that, Lynn. Cut it out. That's why I did that. So go ahead. 
Thank you for letting me in. Hello, Representative Gwen Clark Reeve. I already warned her that questions are not necessary because you just gonna go and go and go. We'd have been through a whole hour. So I want to ask a couple of questions, if I may, Madam. So we started to talk about your uh, eight-year run as state representative in uh, Tallahassee. Um, I actually was around for your first um, election. I was there for your uh, inauguration at the house. It was amazing. I was just on the website today. They have so many pictures of you. And it's so crazy because each era you were in can be judged by each hairstyle you had. Okay? I was just checking out the <laughs> hairstyles. And I was like, every two years, it was a different hairstyle. There she go, rocking this hair. I remember the hairstyle. She steals my hairstyles, y'all. I'm just letting y'all know. So don't be quiet if her hair is long and brown when you see her at the next event. She has every hairstyle she's had. I had it first, except for the one she's rocking now. So anyway, what was that like? Because honestly, if, if I remember correctly, your first election, you were up against some people in power with a bunch of money and even when you won, they did not want to concede to this black woman who finally got in the house. And I believe, as Amelia was saying, and as you and I were discussing this morning, I think two more times you were unopposed. So you've had a phenomenal run as a state representative. Also, to make it even more historic, you were in office all of the eight years that President Obama was in office. So it, it's just like, that color connection was there. The melanin was magic for real. And I, I just want to know, what is that feeling? What is that feeling? Talk to the young people that are out here. You've been kind enough to help some of the up and coming people that are running for office, like Patricia Dixon out in Inglewood, California, who we had on the show. What is that feeling like, election night? Like, what is that like? Like, can you compare it to winning an Oscar or Emmy when you actually win an election, you win your seat and know that the people have had enough faith to ask you to represent them and do what's right by them. What is that feeling like? Well, really, I didn't get that feeling until the following morning because the night of the election, I was busy taking my workers who would work the polls for me, taking them home and making sure that they were safe and uh, that uh, everything was taken care of. We did have a little uh, gathering at one of my neighbor's uh, businesses on Dixie Highway, which was phenomenal. And um, it just it's just a feeling that you have to sit back and say, wow, did I really do this? Am I really going to the state legislature? And for me, it was really um, more, a lot meaningful because um, as you know, Rose, um, one of my fellow commissioners in another city was elected the same time that I was and we were very good friends. In fact, we were roommates in Tallahassee the entire eight years that um, we were there. So um, it was really, really um, a really exciting time. And it was the first time that a female, a person of color uh, was occupying this district seat. It was the first time that my city had ever had anyone elected to the um, state house. And so it was just, you know, everyone was just uh, euphoric about it. Um, the next day w was more exciting, I think, than, than than election night. Awesome. You know what? There's, you know, a lot of people just to educate them for the sake of edification, right? The difference between a representative and a senator, because I see that sometimes when I'm talking with people, they don't really understand the hierarchy of politics, and. You know, I'm always telling people, go talk to your state representative. Go talk to your state representative. Those are the ones that are most connected to the people. Because sometimes to get to the senator is just a little difficult. It's a little different. But if you go to the representative, the representative can get to the senator. I would love for you to expound a little bit about that and what's the difference in the job responsibilities. 
Well, and there's really no big difference in the job responsibilities. You're there to represent the people. I don't care whether you're in the House of Representatives or you are in the state Senate. Um, basically, the terms of office are different. In the House of Representatives, you are there for two year terms. So which means every two years you are in election mode. Uh, you almost get elected now, and then you, you you know you're ready to set up for the next two years because right. um, you the senate senators are four year terms. Uh, in the in the um, state in the state house here in Florida, they are six year terms in the federal, which is the Congress in Washington, U.S. Congress. There's two. Mm -hmm. But the two-year terms uh, for the House of Representatives are the same in both the State House as well as uh, in Washington. And I tell you, I had the awesome, awesome uh, experience of serving along with people like Congressman Alcee Hastings, people like John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis. These are not just names to me. These are people that I actually worked with, that I actually went uh, to the Black Caucus meetings in Washington, and we had were fighting back and forth for our people. And so it's not just a, a, a matter of saying, oh, these people, I knew these people. No, you, my daughter will tell you, come in my house and you will find pictures, you'll find letters, you'll find a lot of memorabilia that I have that I hope that they give to someone important or that it goes in a museum when uh, I am uh, when they have to dispose of it but I want to say to you it is important that particularly females we are looked like you know when you go you're supposed to sit in the back of the room no you get to the table you don't worry about what they say or how they say it. You get to that table and you make sure that your voice is heard, that your opinions are are spoken about, because they like to, you know, like to say, oh, you know, um, well, yeah, we'll 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 hear that, we'll hear that, but no, you make sure that you get up and you do some good trouble. You do some good trouble. And you I make like sure her. that you are here. We need a round I of like applause. That. Where's, Mecca? Where's Mecca with the round yeah. of applause? That was yes, round good trouble, Mecca. Good trouble. <laughs> wow. Lynn, you got another question? No, I was saying we need the applause for that one because what she said was absolutely I know. Cool. We can't sit in the yeah. back and, 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 and shrink our size down or, as they say nowadays, dim our light because other people are afraid of our light shining because our light is so bright. Let your light shine. Get to the table. Say what it is you have to say and let your voice be heard because what we have to say is very important. Look what's going on right now with women's rights. We got a whole bunch of men trying to tell us what to do with our body. Mm. You already know how I feel about that. I'm not trying to hear that. Are they crazy? And you so know, we have to get I up and speak. And I agree with you 200%, Lynn. I, I feel like, you know what I mean, closed mouths don't get fed. And, you know, right now, if you want to change the nature of society, it has to start with us, the nurturers of the world. We're the ones that has the wide view, you know what I mean? And I didn't even realize, ma'am, that every two years, because you, you did how many years at two-year terms? That's pretty crazy. Eight years, like, eight years. Eight eight years. years. <gasps> Four two-year terms. Four yeah. awesome. That's that's insane. That's insane. That that to me is a tribute to how much you really did connect with the people. The people spoke by re-electing you four times consecutively. So kudos to you. Yes, Mecca. That's what I'm saying. Salute, salute. She's an amazing woman. You know, She's a very amazing woman. In your opinion, what would you say is the fundamental change of America um, needs to get back on track? Because I really feel like we're not the country that we used to be, and we're not really representing Hold a lot on. of Let me, let me, let me just stop you right there. Yes, ma'am. We are not looking back. We are looking forward. Okay. Um, 
No. We're, there are things that you will never be able to go back to. The pandemic has changed our whole aura around this country, around where we need to be and what we need to be doing. There's, I, I know I hear people saying, oh, when we go back to normal, when we get back to normal. No, I'm sorry. This is the new normal. There are things that are you're never going to go back to. So mm -hmm. let's just look forward and see where we need to go. Having been through this pandemic, and having to see seeing what has happened uh, with the needs of people. And let me say, we I know that we're concerned definitely about our needs. Black folks have always had needs. We've always, as one might say, been needy, but we are survivors. We know how to take what it needs to take and move forward with it, however it has to be. Look, we, we, we survived slavery, all right? Although some of us are still, still hanging in on a, on the end of it that we don't need to be. But when I talk to people and they tell me, oh, it's so bad out here. Oh, it's so this out here. I said, look, thank God every day you're this side of the dirt. So, you know, it can't be that bad. You've made it another Amen. day. Amen. And we need and to look at moving us. forward and how we can move forward and let our young people who have these skills. Look, when I get on the elevator and a two-year-old has a, a cell phone and she's working out all these games and knows how to connect to this one, that one, and the other, I'm standing there in amazement. So what do I do? I get on board. Tell me. Teach me. You know, we are all in a stage of learning. And the more we learn, the better off we'll be. How we choose to use what we learn, that is the difference. Agreed. You know, I'm glad that you brought that up. So as an educator, what do you feel the curriculum being um, taught in our schools today? And, you know, what do you feel that we need to do to make sure that our children are staying educated and not being what they, you know, media is calling being dumbed down? We as parents need to impart to our children uh, the truth. We need to be speaking out the truth. The truth will set you free. Please do not ever think that you have to dumb down anything. You explain, if it's explained to the person in the correct way, uh, in a way that they can understand, and relating it to their everyday existence, then we can move forward. There is no teaching of, of, if you teach the truth, then you have nothing to worry about. Let them know Agreed. that we know. This is a conversation she and I had this morning if I asked her about clinical race theory. And her comment to me was, there's no critical race theory, there's just American history. If you teach the truth, if you teach real history, then it'll all be encompassed in there. And I agree, but here's what I realized. For me, and I don't know about the rest of you, I didn't start learning about true black history until I was not in high school, but in college, taking black history courses. So yeah. that was the whole 12 years of not getting... All you get is in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? And then you get into a black history class in college and they're like, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me just tell you what happened when Columbus got here. And how about the pilgrims getting here wasn't some big feast. It was actually a slaughter of the people that were already here before that nobody's even talking about. There were indigenous people here before. So that's the part that I want us to not forget. When we're gonna teach American history, teach it all. Don't be selective yeah. and leave out certain parts. Teach the whole history, the truth. Well, you know, I agree with you, Lynn, and you know, my whole my whole attitude towards all of that is that the truth prevails like what um, Ms. Gwendolyn said earlier. And as long as we teach our children how to research the truth, 
you know, know about a Dr. Ben, know about, you know, some of these educators and these experts that spend their time researching, you know, our history and what our true contribution is, and then reiterating it so that as soon as you get that piece of knowledge, you share it, you know, and it's like a That's domino right. effect. Right. You know, um, you know, it's, it's very funny. Um, I look at some folks who have what's called Saturday school. Their, their children may attend the public school system from Monday to Friday. But then on Saturday, there's what's called Saturday school. And it's at that Saturday school that those children are taught their history, are taught what's not given to them in the uh, Monday to Friday everyday school, Monday right. to Friday school system. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of our churches had that. We had uh, Saturday events. And then we had on Sundays, we'd have uh, in the evening uh, at six o'clock, I remember going to uh, young people's uh, events and you, you learned that was there basically that what we did not get in everyday school, as we called it, it was taught to us, our history, things that we questioned and how we questioned them. And they were that. That's when we got that that real deep rooted education, and understanding and that, that um, I don't care what part of this world you come from, you have a history, and you need to know it. And your story is exactly. valid. Your story you know, is valid. Um, mm -hmm. I, when I was a, a young mother, right, my son was only two, three years old, and I felt like I wanted to start as an educator because I graduated from Boston College with an education degree, right? I felt that as an educator, he needed to know his roots. So I put him in a, a private school called Jamis. And I'll never forget one time, one summer, he was going to his grandparents' house in Massachusetts. We were living in New Jersey at that time. And we had all his toys around him packed in the car as we was going back to uh, to New Jersey. And he says, I feel like King Tut. I'm being surrounded by all my belongings. You know, and it was just so <laughs> wonderful to see him understand his <laughs> legacy before him. And I teased him. I said, well, you're not dead. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But for him to make that analogy, I knew that we right. did the right thing because right. we seeded, we planted those seeds, those roots of where you're from and who you really are. And, you know, to seek out that truth. And it's critically important for our children because so much of the images that are out today don't speak to that voice. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, we're going to take it a break. Yeah. We'll be right back. This is a great conversation. We'll be right back. Ow! You're watching Sipping Something Sexy right here on Twitch TV, soon to be on She's the Boss Radio. Okay. Hey, 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 we're back paying these bills. We're back. How I'm, you doing, Lynn? I'm good. I'm good. Hey. I, I had to sip just now. So I was like, I don't want to keep pulling out the picture trying to sip my glass. But I did just think about something um, that you ladies said. And it's unfortunate if you think about it, guys. And I'm going to give you an example. There's a generation after us that doesn't know the stories to pass on to their children and grandchildren. 
Do you know what I'm saying? So if they don't get fed the stories by their elders and people like State Representative Clark Reed, they're not going to be able to, if you don't know where you've been, you can't possibly know where you're going. So they are going to miss that piece of history and hopefully their kids will get it. But it's just so necessary for us, as it always has been, people of color, to hand down the stories, hand down the heritage, hand down our history. You have to know your history. And I just thought about something my mom could tell you. She has always had, up until recently, and I did not know what the thing was. She had it sitting on the table. And I was like, what is this crazy piece of contraption she got sitting here on the table? It's been there for like 20 years. I've been coming here and I was like, what is this thing? What is this thing? Why is it sitting here? And you know, she very calmly said to me, it's a piece of cotton from straight off the tree. And there was nothing else to say after that. I was like, wow. and now I know why it's here. It was and the actual scene. cotton. And, say it again. And scene. Mm. I was just sitting there like, oh, wow. Because I've never seen cotton. I don't know what cotton looked like when you really picked it off the tree. I wasn't there for that part. So she had that. And when she told me what it was, like in that moment, I felt the whole plantation. I felt the slavery. I felt the history. It was no question to ask why she had that sitting there anymore. But for years, I didn't know what this piece of cotton was. I was just like, why does she have this thing sitting there? And then she said, it's a piece of cotton. And then I was like, right, because this is what we built this whole country off of our backs doing this. You know what I mean? So it made so much sense. But if, if you know, somebody else down the road is not going to have a piece of cotton sitting in the, on their coffee table. They're not going to have Very a piece true. of cotton sitting on their coffee table. They're going to have a t-shirt. But when you get to see it in its raw form and realize that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of us every day were whipped and beaten for this piece of white cotton, it makes you see it so differently. Like, wow, this whole country is broken. And you know, Lynn, you bring in a very valid point as far as respecting our elders. You and I talk about it all the time. It mm -hmm. is critically important to spend time with our elders and listen to the stories and the wisdoms and the experience that they have to pass that torch forward. So Miss Clark, Miss Gwendolyn Clark Reed, we would like to know what advice would you love to give us? You know what I mean? As an elder to help us continue to endure and to continue to pass that torch, that light forward, even through the darkness sometimes as melanated people. You know, what do we need to do to keep on keeping on? Well, first of all, you have to know yourself. Know who you are. Know what you stand for. What you will stand for. How much are you willing to give of yourself, of your time, of your talents to help move this country forward, to help move your community forward? Are you going to be someone that says, you know, oh, I saw that happening, but um, I didn't really think it was important. Everything is important. I don't care what's happening in your community. You need to be involved in it. It may not happen on your street, but believe me, it will affect you somewhere mm -hmm. along the way. So we should not stop being involved. We should seek out the um, ideas that we feel are going to be helpful, are going to move us forward. We need to be economically involved in our shopping, looking at how we're spending our money, where we're spending our money, and who we're spending our money with. Okay. So uh, we, we need to not, not forget where it is that we put our, um, our thoughts and our time. So I'm asking that, yes, you register to vote, I'm asking you to vote. I'm asking you to read about the candidates. 
Know who you're voting for. Not just because somebody knocks on your door and say, oh, I think I can do this or I think I can do that. Find out what have they done? Where have they been? What are, if their plans are doable, who are they surrounding themselves with? Know the people that you are voting for. Question them. Question their ideas. And if one can say, stay tuned. And let's see where we go. Exactly. I love that advice. That is so solid. Thank you so much for that. Lynn, you have anything else you want to add? Oh, I think she said it all. Like, I'm just learning to embrace as I get older. I know y'all can't believe it, but I'm getting older. Um, <laughs> that, we have, that we have to move forward. Life moves in one direction. It's forward. Um, I'm embarking on a bunch of new things and new opportunities. I know it's scary. Uh, the longest journey starts with the first step. So I just have to put my faith in God and, and step because you'll never know. Nothing beats a failure but a try. You will never know if you sit here second guessing yourself. You've got to step out on faith and do the work. And I promise you, it's going to have a wonderful ending. So you just got to move forward. But I absolutely believe in this climate that we're in, Everybody has to pay attention, people. Because another thing that I say that, that's going on in politics right now, we get so distracted with the small minutiae they throw out at you that you forget to go behind the scenes and do the homework and the research about what's really going on. So they throw out, I don't want to say fake news, because, but they throw out news, but it's all to get you riled up and on social media and distracted when the bigger issue is getting slid right under the rug and you're not paying attention for it, you're not looking for it. So... Definitely do your homework. Definitely listen to these younger people and hear what they're talking about. Because like I said on our previous show, as much as I want to say a lot of us older people and adults did things, it was the younger people that got out there last year and moved the needle forward with this, with mm -hmm. everything that right. took place as right. change, everything that took place with change and protesting, that was young people that got out there and let their voices be heard. So I think we need to give them a fair shot and keep pushing forward, get behind them, hear them, listen to them, and learn from them. And then we could teach them things, and both together, them teaching us, us teaching them, we can make some strides in this country. We can make some strides as people. Yes. We can move forward mightily. Yeah, intergenerational is key right now. That's the it. word that I'm trying to support and articulate to everybody. You know, it, we have to respect our elders. We have to grab their wisdom while they're here and then pass it on as the intermediaries to the youth. We have that responsibility and we cannot relinquish it anymore and we no longer can pass it to others because others don't care about our children the same way we do. And it does take a village. That's the one thing as an educator I have learned over the years. And I also understand in, you know, speaking with you, ma'am, you have showed me how the individual power definitely ignites the collective power. Had you not gone out and spoke to people and handshaked and made sure things were right within your community and the surrounding communities, you wouldn't have been elected. And that's your individual power that ignited the collective power for the people to vote for you. And, you know, thank you so much for coming on this show and speaking about that because that voice is not really being heard. And we need people like yourself to really talk about what it is. My last question to you, of the many challenges because they were insurmountable. I mean, you started in 68 until now. You know, what was the one biggest lesson you learned about the power of you? The biggest lesson I learned about the power of, of myself was to stand up, push forward, to be involved, I am a part of the Divine Nine. And those of you who are sorority and fraternity folks, you know what I'm talking about. That we stick together, that we get out and we mobilize and we move forward. And folks have to understand that everybody can't be the leader. Sometimes, you know, I think, I, I think I'm the biggest leader around. 
but somebody else behind me may have another suggestion that's a little bit better than mine and, and I need to join forces with them. We have to work together, together to move forward. And that's what I, I find is not really happening. We are kind of sliding off to the side, mm -hmm. but it's together that we will get things done and move forward. That's crazy that you said that. There's been this ideology that's been floating in my head. I really feel like God gave it to me about separation unification. And that if we as a community of people can start congregating and unifying with mindsets that are similar to one another, we then can then observe the others that have a different mindset, respect them, allow them to live within their own mindset, but then be collective because of the respect that we have, you know, and I always say, you know, if somebody's got sticky fingers, I don't want them near me, but there's other people that got <laughs> sticky fingers. So let that sticky fingers be with sticky fingers and you stay out of my circle. But because I respect you, you could be sticky fingers over there and I'll be non-sticky fingers over here. And that's how we can unify as a unit of people, as opposed to come clumping everything all together. And sometimes it just doesn't mix like oil and vinegar. And we're so busy fighting each other. Instead That's of really right. fighting the forces that be. So separation, unification. And I just want to add, I think what she said was so important about her, her being the biggest leader. So y'all don't see it like I see it. So <laughs> this is absolutely the biggest leader. Like she's president. Y'all don't even know it yet. Like she at the White House. But I'm just saying that it, it's true that we can't let ego we can't let ego override what is better for the greater good because we want to hear our voice or we want our platform to be the one that, that everybody is, is following under or listening to. No, you have to be able to sit back and know that everybody can't be the chief. we got to be some Indians. We all got to fall back and play our position. And if we do that collectively, everybody play your position and we come together and do what we need to do. As a people, we will succeed. We will succeed. Exactly. Just well, Mecca, we only got one more minute left in this wonderful hour. It flew by in the chat flew room because I'm not in the studio this time. Were there any questions for uh, Miss uh, Gwendolyn Clark Reed? There probably were, but we missed them. I know I missed it. So I'm just asking uh, Mecca if there were. We were good today. Uh, I mean, people tuned in, though, but nobody had any questions. Had, they, had, they, yeah, they didn't have questions. They were busy listening that. to Gwendolyn Clark Reed hold court. This is what she does. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. So they were, they were listening, well, and they were they, they were just basically you know giving a uh, shout outs and uh you know giving love to y'all to the panel. And so. But so who do we need no to questions. shout out this week? Who do we need to shout out outside of my godchild Nairi? Who do we need to shout out? Nicole. Uh, Almeida, uh Kobe Hustle was in the building. Uh, we had uh, uh, Atana, uh, uh, Diva Brat, uh, Big O. Uh, we had a couple of the soul riders that, that normally come on the other show that we're in here, but they were just, you know, just listening. Excellent. So, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, God. Thank you, everybody, for sipping something sexy with us this Sunday. We're here every second and fourth Sunday. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Sipping Something Sexy. If you missed this episode, we will have the replay not only on Twitch.tv, but also our YouTube channel, Sipping Something Sexy. And Miss Gwendolyn Clark Reed, I cannot thank you enough from the bottom of my heart. I thank you so much for coming on this show today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Till next time, everybody, raise your glass and enjoy your afternoon. Get the sample, please. What we do? Bye, y'all.